engage with us, we do through Google Hangout, we'd be happy to schedule a meeting. But right now we just want to open up to some questions and comments before we turn it over to kind of workshopping some of the lessons that you want to work on. So anything you've heard that you have concerns about, questions, want to know more about, thoughts about, anything that kind of bubbles up from what we've, because we've kind of thrown a lot of content. <coughs> I think that's where we say we or honestly say I have no idea. I'm, I'm sure there's more than two or more than one. Let's find out how many can we come up with. I, I think it's just about being. That's kind of the neat thing about creativity is being willing to embrace the unknown. I have no idea how many solutions there are. In fact, when we did that puzzle today, I had never heard of the idea of like the make the funnel, right? And there's ideas that came up that I've never heard before. So you, you can always be willing to be surprised. I think that's one of the interesting things about creativity. That's a really good question. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I attended a workshop one time, and the presenter said, let the students struggle um, to develop their own understanding. How much of, or what, what would be a healthy environment in which to let students struggle to come to that mini stage? and move their way up the uh, trajectory before you intervene. That's right. So again, when, when and I, I call this the dance of knowing when to like step in and step out. And this is kind of a dance, right? And again, I'm not the kind of doctor who gives prescriptions. So what I will say is a general phrase here. There's a really interesting study once that was done um, by some researchers that were trying to help a teacher reform her practice. She found that every time she talked in the classroom, all the student talk funneled to her. They actually had researchers come in and draw how the talk lines were going. And she wanted students to talk to each other. But every time she talked, they, all the topics started funneling to her. And she was like, talk to each other, and it would come to me. So what she did is she stepped completely out of the conversation right, and let the kids struggle. And they were coming up with a mathematical concept. It might have been something like ratio. They didn't know what it was. And so they decided to come up with their own definition, and they voted on it, and it was wrong. And eventually she had to come in and tell them it was wrong. And that was not productive at all. Those students were like, you wasted our time. Why didn't you just tell us it was wrong in the first place? So that's an example of stepping way too far out. So it is this kind of dance of knowing when to step in and step out. What I've seen really effective teachers do in situations like that is they do things, and you probably, some of you probably do this. Ask somebody else first, or ask two other people first. Go around the classroom, ask some of your peers first before you ask me. Right, that could be a, a approach to doing that. So you give them some time, but there should always be a time where it's just most efficient and effective just to step in and, and correct. But I think you have to read the situation that way. You might give them an opportunity to explore it first, but when you're really stuck, then come to me. So that's one way I would suggest doing that. I think peers can, like that second grade math example, peers explaining content sometimes is more powerful than adults explaining content. Right? ways of doing things to others. So I think exploring that within your own classroom, and it's going to differ by the, the classes you work with. Any comments about that? <laughs> Other thoughts, comments, questions? I'm yes. just wondering, are we going to talk a little bit about project-based learning and then maybe finish up with what this presented in my life? Is that possible? Yeah, we'll do that in the after lunch okay. component, yeah. definitely. So we'll talk about projects. Um, but we're going to now transition, I think, to lessons. Unless there's another question? I have a quick yeah. question. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not sure of the context I ask it in, but um, Ms. Anson had mentioned three levels of, um, of um, uh, and it was part of the discussion of feedback, but it's not directly related to feedback. One was <coughs> Oh, um, Bob Sternberg um, had a theory of intelligence uh, where he argued that we only focus on what he calls analytic intelligence or the compare and the contrast, or the making judgments, or something, you know. And he argued equally important was creativity, which obviously we've been talking about. His third one was um, practical intelligence, or like street smarts, or applying it to their daily lives. And there are ways of doing, emphasizing practical intelligence that also will tap into creativity. Um, there are, but it, it's the same way that Gardner has his list of the eight different ways you can be intelligent. Sternberg has his three. He's more recently added 
the concept of wisdom, um, but it's um, kind of an idea of, of how, we, how our abilities are, are structured, and they're more um, preferences for how to go about an, act, an, act, an activity, and that if there's too much of a mismatch, um, it can lead to loss of student engagement, and you know, if, if you're only here in, let's say, analytic, and the student is, is in, in I tend to see things as, as taking a little bit from this, a little bit from that. So he's very much of that, but I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, and I think the take home point to that is creating an option for students to express their understanding, giving them many different ways to express what they know, right? And the interesting thing is more choices is not necessarily better. The key again is can a kid see themselves in one of those choices? One choice could be great for some students. 50 choices could be terrible for some students, right? It's like, can you give them different ways of representing what they know? Um, the best, just to illustrate that successful intelligence, in Sternberg's book on successful intelligence, one of the best examples he gives to illustrate the difference between analytic intelligence, which is like school smarts, versus practical intelligence, is two kids are walking along in the forest, and they come across um, a baby bear and then a mama bear, right? And so the kid who has analytic school smarts, he's doing all these calculations. And the other kid's putting on his running shoes. And the kid who has analytic intelligence basically says, based on my calculations, there's no way we can outrun this bear. And the kid who has street smarts ties up his shoe and says, I don't need to outrun that bear. I just need to outrun you. Right? <laughs> and so that's about success. How do you be successful in an environment that calls for different ways of thinking? We want to expand opportunities for students to practice different ways of thinking, but also to show us how they can think in different ways. But sometimes it could be, there might be kids who have a, a really visual way of representing things. Maybe you let them draw a picture. I do that on my final exam, like, you know, some of my college students. If you can illustrate your response on this essay, do it. Just make sure it's clearly labeled, right? And some students take me up on that. So I think finding different ways for them to represent their knowledge, but also, like James says, allowing them to try things where they might not feel comfortable. So it's not just always using that venue. And the idea is that the, that the different types of choices isn't just creativity. You know, this isn't, yes, it will work for creativity, but it, there are many other ways that, you know, maybe you, if, if you want to emphasize more emotional intelligence, or you want to emphasize resiliency, or any of these constructs where you could potentially have an assignment, one of the choices, emphasizing whatever it is that you want to bring to the table. It doesn't, it's not just for creativity. Other thoughts? Okay, so what we're going to do now is move to your work and just try to illustrate, have you demonstrate to yourself and to each other how you can put some of these uh, ideas into practice. So I think the thing that I often do with this that I think is really important um, is if you can do it with a, a topic that you dread teaching or that you're you know, struggling with or you haven't taught before, but something you have to teach as part of your curriculum, if you can infuse creativity in there, then you can certainly do it in, in other things you teach. So, the first thing we want you to do is just take some time and you know, be clear on what is a topic or activity or whatever it is, a lesson that you do not like to teach. It's just you dread it, you have to teach it every year for whatever reason, or that you know you're going to be teaching this year and you've just been kind of avoiding it. So the first thing is just talk about that to at least one other person. Share that out and then we'll hear a couple examples just to hear what we're working with. Okay? Take a moment, talk to somebody about that. What's something you dread teaching? 